Are we good? Are we good or are we good? Huh? Well, I'm on the lively. The answer is always yes. <laughs> Do we need more beer? Yes. Yes. Always. Yes. Oh, I, 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 I hit the one. Okay, good. All right, thank you. Thank you. I, I'm being pampered as a speaker. They have special water for me. Uh, Does it come in a bottle? Yes. <laughs> it's Fuji water, which I feel a little bad about because apparently they're exploiting the Fijians in order to get it. But whatever. <laughs> well, we should thank Delphix for the beer because this is left over from ZFS Day. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody have ZFS Day or Lumos Days? Yeah. Yes. That was good. Yeah. I, was uh, good. <laughs> speakers excluded. <laughs> All right, uh, I'm Ben Rockwood. I'm the Director of System en Engineering. Uh, my other title is uh, Director of Cloud Operations, but I don't like that title because I fundamentally think I'm a system engineer. Uh, so that's what I stick with a joint. Um, and we're not really going to talk about anything joint related tonight. Yay! <laughs> if you have joint cloud questions or smart OS questions, we're happy to entertain that, and there's lots of people around who can answer those. Uh, uh, but the, the topic of discussion tonight is DevOps. DevOps is something I've been extremely interested in um, for a long time. Patrick Dubois, who's the father figure of DevOps and coined the term, um, and I uh, uh, kind of found each other a long time ago, and it's been something I've had a real interest in. Um, this is sort of an advanced DevOps talk in that this is sort of comes from the perspective that you know what DevOps is and, and I want to clarify some of the, the background where it came from. Uh, since very few of the people involved in DevOps know where most of the ideas that they're discussing in fact came from. Um, and so I wanted to shed that light and I've been doing it pretty successfully. Um, but uh, that means that I need to kind of gauge where y'all is at. So, how many people know what DevOps is? You have to ask the embarrassing question if you don't raise your hand, you look bad <laughs> first to get people to raise your hand. Um, how many people would say that they're practicing DevOps? Okay, that's good. Um, how many people will have no idea what DevOps is really about that you've heard the term? Okay. Wait a second. Wait. I saw. Uh, I think there was some we're doing thing. DevOps. I think. I don't know. Well, that's a bit, how many people? Have you, how many of you are here tonight? Think maybe you're doing DevOps, but you're not sure. Another question. Huh? Sorry. Okay. So. Uh, <laughs> so then we'll we'll do the classical uh, breakdown. How many of you would call yourselves predominantly developers? Okay, and how many would call yourselves predominantly sysadmins? Yay, my peoples. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is a slide that may uh, or may not drive with you. DevOps fundamentally <coughs> is about solving the problem where you, you probably got this book, but you should have gotten it with this book, and you didn't. You just got that one. And ever since then, you've been trying to figure it out the rest of your own. Um, this is not about titles. Anyone who's here who is a DevOps, you're full of crap. There is no one who is a DevOps. It's not a title. It's something we do. And it's solving a fundamental problem, which is that system administration isn't what it used to be. Um, the way I describe this to Max outside, it's actually a good analogy, so I just, um, to kind of describe, some people get this, Price, like I'm no longer a sysadmin, I am now a DevOps. No, you're not. Um, there are lots of cooks, right? Lots of people can become cooks and very good cooks and go to CIA and become amazing culinary experts. The skills necessary to be a cook are important, but they're a uh, they're foundation, right? When you go to become a chef in a restaurant, it all's different, right? You're not, not a cook anymore. The skill set required is very different. That's kind of what we're talking about fundamentally when we talk about <coughs> DevOps and system administration. I am still a sysadmin and will always be a sysadmin until I die. That's who I am, what I do, what I'm all about. Um, but 
The skills that I learned in this book did not prepare me to run a cloud. Did not prepare me to have thousands of customers with very different desires, very different needs, all running in concurrency. This book would have really helped me. But the only way you would have ever been given this textbook is if you went and took an MBA. And if you did take an MBA in your two years of training or whatever it is, you would have taken probably one class and you may or may not have even been given this book because most MBA programs today focus on policy rather than on the core. Who's ever heard of operations management? That is so much better than I'm used to. <laughs> um, operations management is, is a study of operations. And what is operations? Operations is doing what you do, what your business does. In classical organization, you sort of actually only have three branches of an organization. You have, you have executives, which manage sales, um, uh, finance, and operations. So everything your business does, whether it's making hot dogs, or jumbo jets, or showing movies, that's your operations. Um, this is one thing that's happening in DevOps is people get a little too polarized with the idea of, of operations is just running the website. In a classical MBA sense, operations includes your development organization. And it's part of the operations of your company. So give you a sense of kind of the ballpark we're in here. <coughs> so now I'll go back to the beginning. So there are a lot of ideas that have all come together in what we call uh, DevOps. All right. General, this, this really kind of came out of a uh, strive towards agile operations. That is, that lots of people in operations teams, full system administrators, looked at the agile uh, uh, transformation that really occurred uh, uh, in the last decade and thought, we need to do that too. Let's do that too. Right? Scrum, yeah, let's use that. Um, putting everything in, 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 uh, in, uh, in Git, Pfft, let's do that. Um, didn't really work so good um, for reasons that we'll cover later. Um, this movement of agile operations and trying to make it work and revisioning it over and over and over, how do we become agile, 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 didn't work until Patrick Dubois, who's one of the primary people thinking about how, how to try and do this, to the point that he actually rewrote the agile manifesto for operations. He just like strike through bits and change the terminology, uh, came up with this idea of coined this term DevOps. And all of a sudden, it congealed, and we had a word that codified who we were, and what was most important was not necessarily what we were doing, but the ideas that we had, the things that we were trying to accomplish, what we wanted to do, and then we finally had this word that brought us all together to share these ideas and grow. DevOps is very much a thing in flux. Uh, ideas are changing all the time, and it is growing. Uh, and it has a very, very long way to go. Um, my mission has been to try and uh, bring a little bit of sanity in, in pulling us back into the greater world of operations, in the MBA sense, of this, it's, this uh, large amount of information that's out there that we can benefit from, particularly things out of manufacturing. Right? If you've read anything about, about DevOps, at some point you see some analogy to manufacturing, you're like, what the fuck? Why are we talking about manufacturing also? Because they've had a lot of the same problems that we have now. And they solved them a long freaking time ago. We should read their shit and steal as much of it as possible. Okay? So, there are a number of different ways that people codify uh, DevOps. One of the most, uh, uh, the, the general overarching definition was made by Adam Jacobs, who, run, who started Ops Code and Chef. Uh, which is that DevOps is a cultural and professional movement, period. Okay, that goes back to what I was saying before. Nobody is a DevOp. It's a cultural change in our profession. Okay, that's it. Um, the other model came from uh, John Willis and uh, Damon Edwards, who run the uh, DevOps uh, uh, Cafe podcast, which is generally considered gospel. Um, if you haven't listened to that podcast, go and listen through all of them. Right? A lot of the ideas are there, the great, the great thinkers and DevOps are all there, um, and that's been a really important source of information for DevOps in general, so listen to it. Um, they had this idea called CAMS, culture, automation, measurement, and I think service, um, uh, which is a good model. They've kind of changed it. They've added a couple things into it. 
this is the way I codify it, is that it breaks down fundamentally into three things. The collaboration of people, the convergence of process, and the creation and exploitation of tools. Okay? And what's important is, is that we go top down, not bottom up. Right? A lot of people have heard about DevOps and what do they hear? Tools, 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 tools. Right? What is DevOps? DevOps is puppet. DevOps is chef. I'm doing chef, I'm therefore DevOps. Yeah. We're gonna get into that. So in this talk, we're gonna go through these three areas and we're gonna talk about them, where they draw from what's important. Now, important overarching concept. There's one word you wanna burn into your skull, tattoo on your forehead so that you can see it every time you look in the mirror. Is flow. Everything is about flow. In a service organization, we always want to be thinking about flow, flow, flow. This is your bosses. These are the business people over here. They create requirements, what the market wants. Those requirements go into development. Development creates a product. They produce software. They're producing a good, right? That's good is going to go into your operations team. Your operations team is going to deploy it into production, right? At that point, the good becomes a service. So it services your end customers, right? Customers are going to consume it. They're going to have opinions. They're going to buy it. They're not going to buy it. And all of those considerations are going to go back into your requirements, your business people, and you're going to go back and forth through this loop. Now, of course, this loop in reality is far more complex than this, right? And it's not just your dev team and your ops team, as the name suggests, right? There's QA in there, hopefully. There's release management in there, maybe. Um, you've got all kinds of marketing people and sales people and executives and layers and this and that, and you're split across multiple companies. Okay, it can be very complicated. Fundamentally, this is what we're talking about, right? Idea, good, service to the market, right? Flow. And we want to keep things flowing. The, the easier things that flow through there, the more happy you are, right? When we have a shitty company, we have bad bosses, we have bad experience, generally it flows really bad, right? Stuff gets bottled up here, they're doing things that these guys don't want, customers aren't sure about it, they're, you know, and it gets all jacked up, right? Flow, we want to flow through, okay? So throughout this whole thing, be thinking about flow, encouraging flow. So first, the collaboration of people. <clears throat> Who's heard of Simon Sinek? He did a TED talk, it was amazing. You go to TED, TED's website, and you look at the most popular uh, talks out there, I think last I checked he was number two, which is odd because he was at one of like TEDx something. Um, he wrote a book called Starting With Why, um, and he's probably a genius because um, you notice why is the most powerful question anyone can ever ask, right? You don't have to know what you're talking about, what you're doing. All you have to say is why. And it's the smartest question you can ever ask. Kids are very good at this. <laughs> What's a community? What's a culture? It's a group of people. People. With a common sense of values and beliefs when we're surrounded by people who believe what we believe, something remarkable happens, trust emerges. It's an important subject when it comes to dealing with people. Trust is something that happens among people who believe what we believe, right? Trust is not about whether somebody does what they say they're going to do. That just means they're reliable, okay? Trust is when somebody else believes like you believe. Chances are that the friends that you're around, they believe what you believe, right? And these can happen in all kinds of different strange circles, right? Um, you ever been in a, in, a, in, a, in a foreign town and somebody says, hey, I'm from San Francisco, you're like, hey, San Francisco! And you, there's a connection, right? There's this weird connection. You have no idea who they are. If they were in San Francisco, you're like, fuck you. <laughs> um, if you've ever gone to a foreign country and you hear an accent on the train and you're like, hey, you're an American! You know, where are you from? I'm from Arizona. Yeah, hey, I'm from California. Hey, and you're best friends, right? Because you have something in common. You believe something the same. 
And it's strange how that works. This is why people gravitate around certain tribal instincts, right? You know, hey, you like Ruby? I like Ruby, right? We have an instant connection. We instantly trust each other because we, we, we've demonstrated we believe something simple, okay? So how that works is really important because culture is really important, but it's a very ambiguous sort of thing. What is culture? You can dissect it a whole lot of different ways. So trying to think about culture and how ambiguous it is, I ain't like any of the definitions. So when you don't like any of the definitions, you go back to the Webster's, okay? And there are, I think, 16 different definitions in Webster's for culture. And this is the one that fits the best, which is a culture is a set of shared attitudes, values, goals, and practices that characterizes as an institutional organization. Okay? What's interesting is, is that these are tiered. So we can rip these apart. So here's our attributes. Shared values, shared goals, shared practices, shared attitudes. If you think about that, you can actually start to do some extrapolations on that that help us learn how to start hacking culture. So how do you implement culture? You determine what your core values are. This is normally what your founder does, right? This is why there's normally a prolific founder at a company, right? And you may not like anything else about that company, but that guy, he believes what I believe. We've got, we've got something. I, 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 he shares my core values, right? Create goals, which meet business needs that are consistent with your values, right? So all these goals, what are we going to do? What are we actually going to accomplish? We're going to figure out what those are based on those values. We're going to have these goals. So now we know what we believe and we know where, what we want to do. <laughs> Behind that, we're going to create core practices, which simplifies the process towards those goals. How are we going to do that in a consistent, unified sort of way so we're all working together? And then you can use these attitudes. Test all this with the attitudes. Everyone kind of gets together. Well, what's the actual attitude? How do people feel? Are, there, are they anxious, stressed out, angry, pessimistic? Those attitudes can tell you a lot about whether or not you actually share those core values, whether or not you actually have created sound goals that you all believe in, and that you actually have practices that you're following. So then we can twist that. We can alter our culture using that. So we want to alter culture, what do we want to do? We want to listen carefully to those attitudes of our employees. Right? Everyone may say it's fine, but if they're huffing and puffing, <sighs> okay, we can go ahead and do that for you. It's a sign that something's wrong. Determine what the value, uh, which values aren't being embraced. Right? Do you need to change the values? Do people not understand the values? This happens a lot when you hire people over a long period of time. The original stock get it because they probably spent a lot of time with the founder. People hired on later don't. They hired him because their buddy was there or you know, they were on Hacker News a lot or something like that. Um, examine the current goals of the organization. Are the goals consistent? Have they changed? What's going on there? Are they consistent with these? And then adjust the practices so that you're always driving towards that goal, right? Nobody likes working for a company that's got lofty goals but never seems to be moving towards them. So there's some ways we can start to alter culture. Deming is a very important uh, individual. I won't belabor you with how awesome he is, but he's insanely awesome. Um, and he has a list of seven deadly diseases of management. And the one that rings true with me, and I think a lot in our industry, is number one, lack of constancy of purpose. These people don't even know why they're in business. Why are we fundamentally here? Why do we exist as an organization? What the frick is the point, right? Because if you can't answer that, it's really hard to get anyone behind you, little less get your customers engaged, right? And this is something that has really been degraded by a lot of people over the last 15 years. And as well, you know, if you're building a product and your customers just don't get it, you need to pivot. Pivot. You don't even know what you want to build? And then you're going to just, oh, well, we'll just build whatever they want. And then everyone's just going to stand behind that and get behind that and be engaged in that? I think so. Simon Sinek came up with this idea of the golden circle. And there's a lot of interesting things that can be drawn with that. 
they work in layers. You start with why. This is very emotional. Okay. Then we move on to how. Then we move on to what. Why we do it. How we do it. What we do. And what Simon found is this maps actually very much to the layers of our brain, right? Why is something that's very, very deep in our minds. Part of our mind that doesn't even have a language. It has no way to rationally express ideas. That's our emotional mind. Out here is a very logical mind, front. It has facts and figures and can convince ourselves of certain things. Now, there's all kinds of interesting things you can see about this. A company like Apple is a company that's all about why. Think different. Change the status quo. You know. It's not like, yeah, I get that. You believe what I believe. Change it, man. Make the best thing possible, right? We get very behind that. You go with other companies like, say, a Dell. We have uh, 3.2 gigahertz Intel Xeon processors. And that's like, okay. They don't connect with you here. They may have all what you need, but you know, it never really connects, right? Companies that are really smart are the ones who focus on the why, why they do it. All this can fall behind it. But if you start out here with what you want to do and have no idea why and you try to build this backwards, right, and figure out why you're doing it after you started doing it, really, really hard. It's definitely hard to convey that message to your customers, right? These are the companies we love. This is why Apple produced a phone and there were lines around the block to get it, right? Before we even knew what it was. We gotta have it. Apple did it, it's gotta be good, right? Dell and Acer and lots of other people have made phones and TVs and we're like, what the hell? It's just a part manufacturer. Why the hell would I buy a TV from Dell? That's stupid. But I guarantee you, if Apple put a flat screen TV on the market tomorrow, you'd be like, hell yeah, I'm in line, baby. I'm getting me one of those, right? In fair, some of the 30 inches are pretty nice. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know they are. Um, but unfortunately, you're only going to get a very tiny, small part of the, the market, right? Okay, so that's an important model that drives us. In DevOps, this is really important. If you're just trying to, if you're just reading the news about DevOps and you start implementing tools and things like this, you're focusing on the what they're trying to do. You're not focusing on why, and you're never going to get it. Never going to get it. You're going to be very frustrated, in fact. You've got to start with why. Okay? And what's our fundamental why? That's your customer, right? I'm assuming all of us are in the web one way or another, right? This is our customer, okay? All of us sitting here in the room that we're all trying to impress and be cool to, not our customers. Not our customers woman with a baby, with somebody else screaming in the other room, on the bed with a laptop, that's probably your customer, right? She's the one we gotta focus on. What is this? Anyone know what this is? That looks like a like Con Edison or something. Yeah, yeah. This is the control room of a nuclear power plant. It's very impressive. I would love to tell you that my operations dashboard looks just like it. <laughs> I'm not there yet, but I'm getting there. Right, Elijah? We're getting there. It, it, we're getting there. Kind of smells bad compared to the nuclear plant. <laughs> <laughs> we're all going to wear white lab coats cool, soon, too. It's going to be part of Joint's philosophy. <laughs> Why do we build this? Why do we build it? We build it so that she can vacuum her floor. That's it. Right? You don't build it for other nuclear scientists. You don't build it for anything more exciting that there should be a plug in somebody's house so they can plug something like a vacuum cleaner into and vacuum their floor. She needs a room bus. <laughs> right? And it's kind of depressing. You're like, we spent a lot of time and energy and science <laughs> so that she can vacuum her floor. But that's fundamentally what it's about, right? What, think of all of the electrical devices in your house. How many of them are, are, are any of the electrical devices in your house so impressive that it justified building that? No, but they built that so that you could use your toaster. <laughs> That's why it exists, okay? It's something we need to keep in mind when we build our operations, when we build our products, right? Um, we need to be thinking about 
the end 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 user and not just our buddy <coughs> the local you know sig okay so that's people convergence of process and you know it's going to be exciting man when we start talking about process right i mean that thing's more exciting than process and you know who loves process <laughs> people who love process are generally people who are stuck and trapped under a really bad one. All right, Peter Drucker, legendary management guru. He he was he really is awesome. Honestly, and facetiously, you should read all of his books. They're amazing. Um, efficiency is doing things right. Effectiveness is doing the right things. And the interesting thing about this is what this tells us. Is that if we increase the effect, the efficiency of the wrong thing, we're actually making things worse, right? The real core here is: Are you doing the right thing in the first place, right? We've all fought these battles, right? That you, we have all had that moment where we stood up to the man, because we were like, "Yeah, we're working really hard on it. We're doing really good work. We're committing a lot of lines of code." To the wrong damn thing. Nobody wants it. It's not the right thing to do in the first place. They're like, no, but we're going to make it the best thing in the world. It's like you're usually the best piece of crap in the world, <laughs> right? But we get efficiency. Something to get really hung up on, right? We're all kind of creatures of habit. When you get running on something, you just want to keep going, going, going. We have this perfectionist instinct. We want to make it the best that we can. We continue to own it. A lot of times, we're not even doing the damn right thing in the first place. This is really hopefully what our managers and what our founders and our board of directors are ensuring that we're doing the right things in the first place so that we can make them more effective, okay? They're different things. Now, when it comes to DevOps, there's a number of fields of study that influence where we're at with DevOps. It's not just like three guys on a blog who like had beers, but it sort of was, but there's a lot more that comes in behind it. We start with Agile. Right? That one's obvious, right? Agile's cool, Agile's awesome. Um, Agile caused development to go off into a whole new sort of realm. And sysadmins were just left there with nothing. Um, I'll get into what our nothing was, I think, a little bit. Then there's other fields that we found, like operations management. This is generally what people think of with uh, how to run a manufacturing plant. Right? But it's more broad than that. We kind of talked about it before. The areas of systems thinking and systems dynamics. Anybody go to MIT? If you went to MIT, you would have spent a lot of time on this. Um, the theory of constraints from Dr. Goldratt. We'll talk about that a little bit. Lean. Lean is the American name for the Toyota production system, which was influenced by Deming and a couple others that we talked about before. We'll get into a little bit about what that's about. And then this big monster. This is, they, devs had Agile, we had IT service management, right? Most of us only know of IT service management because of compliance. And it's just big, nasty, bureaucratic thing we all hate. We don't even know what it is, but it's awful. So we'll talk about that. And the most used form of IT service management is IT. Okay, so let's start with uh, Agile. We've all read the Agile Manifesto, I know. If you have it tattooed to your back, you get bonus points. Right? But if you haven't seen it in a long while, this is it. And remember what it says is that the things, both things are important, but the things on the left are more important to us than the things on the right. We're going to prefer the things on the left over the things on the right. So we're going to prefer individuals and interactions over process and tools. We're going to prefer working software over comprehensive documentation. We're going to prefer customer collaborations over contract negotiation. Who doesn't love contract negotiations? And responding to change over following a plan. That's Agile. That's the Agile Manifesto. Everything we've gotten, all these great things, came out of these very four simple ideas. Right? And I think we'd all agree, Agile's been huge. Right? Huge. Completely transformed the industry. Very important, very simple. So, sysadmins wanted to follow this, 
right? Particularly if you were in an operations team, sysadmin, working with a bunch of developers who had now transformed everything from the waterfall old project management styles into using Agile, you wanted to do it too, right? It was the, and, and so we tried to make Agile operations work. It didn't. Uh, it was the idea that birthed DevOps in the first place. It was the term that came to replace Agile operations. If you look back at Velocity, if you ever participate in Velocity and took those talks, go back to the 2009 conference and look at the videos. You won't hear anyone say DevOps. You will hear people say Agile operations. Look at the 2010 videos. People are now saying DevOps and meaning the same thing. Scrum does not work for operations. Has anybody tried Scrum for ops? How'd it go? Horrible. Yeah. It's my project. Re oh, <laughs> you bastard. Everyone will be given a, a switch and we will we'll get you. Leave that poor man alone. Um, now the ideas are sound, but they're incomplete and they tend to reinforce silos, okay? Now, <clears throat> why doesn't Scrum work? That's the question. Why doesn't it work? We know it doesn't work, but why doesn't it work? Gene Kim, everyone knows who Gene Kim is, right? Okay, yeah, he's the man. Gene Kim uh, founded a company called Tripwire, wrote a very cool piece of software back in the 90s. Uh, he then later uh, wrote a number of books, most notably uh, Visible Ops, which turned ITIL into something for human beings. And he's uh, been working on a book that will be published, I think, in January, called When IT Fails. That's the book, When IT Fails. Um, it is a business model modeled on The Goal, written by Goldratt. It is a novel. Goldratt uh, was going to write a book about manufacturing and operations management ideas, but he knew that nobody actually reads books. They skim them. They look at the bullet points, and they kind of move on. So he said, screw you. I will write a novel, and you will have to read it. Um, and people did. Um, and it was very good, and it's, it's been hugely popular. So Gene Kim is following that model in When IT Fails. They're writing uh, another book together with uh, Patrick Dubois, um, uh, John Willis, and uh, Orzen, and a couple others called the DevOps Cookbook that'll come out later, IT Revolution Press. Anyway, in When IT Fails, there are a lot of interesting ideas. But this, this is the really important concept. He says that there are four types of work that you do in an operations team, okay? There are business projects. So this is implementing a new service. This is what your product managers are coming in telling you to do. You're gonna be doing business projects. These are things that are gonna service customers, okay? You have internal projects. This is the stuff you wanted to do, nobody else in the organization knows about or cares about generally, but it's something really good. If you're in a de development organization, that might be something like, you know, uh, building the Jenkins build server or something like that, right? It's not actually contributing, but it's an internal project that would help you. This might be, you know, implementing uh, a new configuration management system, switching over to Puppet or Chef or something, right? These are the projects <laughs> we generally want to do that nobody else gets. Then you got plan changes, right? These are generally tickets. Right? You got a ticket queue, that's the thing you look at every morning, that's, you've got X number of tickets in your queue, these are plan changes. If you have a full IT, uh, ITIL system, then you'll actually, these would be the things you take to a board, you know. And then you've got unplanned changes. This is break fix. This is somebody coming onto you in the IRC channel or the Jabber channel or whatever communication, maybe you have a phone call and you're going, dude, the database is down, dude, it's slow, you know, it's, Something's broken, something, right? It never makes it into it. You're like, hey, dude, you need to open a ticket for that. Oh, no, it needs to be done right now, right? These are the four types of work that we do. Now, why doesn't Scrum work? Scrum has the idea of a backlog, right? You take all the things that need to be done and you put them onto the backlog. Then the Scrum master prioritizes the backlog, figures out which are the things that need to be done, and puts them into a time-boxed window in order to be done. Right? This assumes that all your work is essentially the same. The problem is, it's not <laughs> four different types of work. Right? If you don't understand that you have four types of work, you're trying to figure out why certain things don't happen. Because what happens when things are on your backlog? These things fast track themselves out. Right? 
These things that have to go to the front of the line all the time. And there's always enough of them that they're always going to the front of the line, which means none of the rest of them are happening, right? You're hoping to get to these. These are generally what you have a metric for, the number of tickets you've done or whatever. These things you make, make you feel better, but you're like, oh, I've got zero tickets, I closed them all, right? That never actually happens because you're dealing with these. These are all those things you want to do, but you never really get around to. All right, business projects are things you're probably actually supposed to be getting done for the business, right? It works, doesn't it? This jives with what we do, doesn't it? When I read his book and saw this, I was like, holy shit, that makes so many things make sense. I'd always thought of them as one thing. I knew they weren't the same thing, but I didn't know how to break them down. This works. Um, and it helps us understand that's why Scrum, that's why Scrum never worked. Never worked. If you had four separate backlogs or something, um, Kanban can work, right? But it doesn't break break these down. So this is really, really important. When you understand this, um, I find that it helps me a lot, especially when I'm getting frustrated why certain things get pushed, pushed, pushed all the time, right? Because the things I want to do are these internal projects. Those are the things that will make me feel better. Because you generally know, if I can get my internal projects done, I'll have less unplanned change, right? I can execute plan changes faster, right? But I can never get to those. And somebody's always screaming at me about one of these, right? So this has a lot of very important kind of ramifications, Scrum being one of them, okay? Um, so the book will be out in January. I highly recommend you get it. Um, you should read it. More importantly, you should buy a copy and give it to your boss. The real intention of this book was not to tell you what to do. It's to give it to your boss so your boss can, can come back to you and be like, I'm so sorry, your life sucks so bad, and I never really understood why, right? <laughs> That's what this book is for. Um, and hopefully will be a big success and a lot of people will finally understand why IT is crushing their companies and why we all look like incompetent buffoons all the time. Right? It's frustrating, right? Why can't you get it done faster? Because you set me up to fail. I don't know what you're talking about. You have all the resources you need. Why am I not getting it done? Okay. So, the field of operations <coughs> management. Um, this is something I stumbled upon. Mm -hmm. I've been studying Deming, I've been studying uh, Goldrow, I've been studying all sorts of things, and I one day happened to cross, in the strangest of all possible ways, an operations management book, title, operations management, a textbook. And I went, that couldn't possibly have anything to do with what I do. And I flipped through it and my mind was blown. Apparently people have been operating things for hundreds of years. <laughs> uh, and, and they've thought about it and they, they've come up with theories and, and they've written them down, believe it or not. They've written them down. Um, this is something you only get to in an MBA program, though. It's a traditional study of management. This is where you be, operations management is where you go to become a, a you know, mid-level manager, right? The people we hate. <laughs> we do, don't mince around it, just be honest. <laughs> Until you become one, and then you're like, oh yeah. <laughs> this is my theory about managers. Manage, nobody ever wants to be a manager, right? Everyone's like, I'm never gonna be a manager, man. I'm gonna be a hardcore coder at 45, 65, I'm gonna code the rest of my life. And I find that the way that you become a middle manager is at some point you're so tired of all your managers sucking, you're like, screw it, I can do it myself. And then you suck at it. <laughs> and then you hire younger people and they do it to you. And you're like, oh, that's why everyone hated me when I was 25. <laughs> anyway, generational rollover. Some of the areas of study inside operations management are things like scheduling, mm, project management, that could be useful. Process measurement, wow, that would have been handy to learn. Quality, I put scheduling on there twice. It's really important. <laughs> so, you, right, waveline theory, all these sorts of things. What if you'd learn this as part of a CS program? What if it kind of helpful, right? Um, this is one of those things that I, I really think that CS management, uh, CS education, as broken as it is, one of the things it has to do is it has to include this field of study. And it should be like an accounting class. It can be the thing that you hate, and oh, you do the homework and you forget about it. But 10 years later, 
when you're trying to, to schedule something and you go, hey, wait, <laughs> there's a book on this. I should probably pull that book back out again. It would be really handy. Um, so previously it focused predominantly on manufacturing. Today it's all about service. And what is operations? Operations is service. Um, it also includes uh, some things you may have heard of, TOC, the theory of constraints, we're gonna talk about in a minute, lean, totally the production system, things like Six Sigma, that one stands out, everyone's like, oh, Six Sigma, black belts and things like that. Okay, that's operations management. It's important. Um, I make a big deal about it because if somebody told me about this 10 years ago, I'd be a much smarter dude than I am today. All right, systems thinking. Systems thinking is a field of study. Um, it's something that's very important, particularly at schools like MIT. Now, systems thinking, what is systems all about? A system is a whole that cannot be divided into interdependent parts, okay? And if you do, the essential properties of the system are those which none of its parts have. Okay? You are a system. All right? Um, you cannot be divided into your parts. Right? It's possible. Your, hand, your hand can, no, it's not. It's actually <laughs> totally not. Uh, your hand can write, right? Chop it off, and put it on a table, and see what it does. Probably doesn't do much, mm -hmm. right? The system only works with all of its components, right? And what's important is that the system, the qualities, the inherent qualities of a system are not the sum of its parts, but the sum of its behaviors and a product of their interactions, right? What makes you is not your individual parts, it's how all of your parts work together, right? A Ferrari is a fantastic car. It is not a fantastic car because it has a great engine nor that it has great tires, nor that it has a great leather seat. But you put all those things together, and the sum of their behaviors is what produces a really awesome system, right? We've all heard of silo mentality, right? Most people, when they, they think of DevOps, the first thing that comes to your mind is silos, right? Silo of Dev and the silo of Ops, right? If we don't use systems thinking, these are two independent things. And what do we do? We, we enforce efficiency within each of those silos, right? Um, one of the most efficient things that you could do for software development is to never give it to customers, right? <laughs> Speeds things up tremendously. Um, not real good. When I talk about flow, this is what we're really talking about, systems thinking. You wanna think about your entire organization which is why it's also not just about dev and ops. It's about the entire organization. If you just optimize those two groups together, you get another clusterfuck, right? We have to think of the entire system. Now here's a common uh, kind of mental exercise that's used in systems thinking courses and things like that, which is to imagine that your company just burned down. Everything you've got is gone. This is all your backups are gone, everything's toast. Okay? And you have to completely start over from scratch, 100%. All you've got is the people. Um, what would you do differently? <coughs> How would you change it? How would you build it better than it was before? Okay. Now here's the thing. If you cannot answer that question, you're screwed. Because if there's no constraints, I mean everything's gone, you have to rebuild it anyway. If there are no constraints and you don't know what to do, how on the earth can you change anything with all the constraints of daily life, right? And a lot of us have a hard time. We like to micromanage and kind of push out little efficiencies all over the place, right? And say, well, what would you change in your company if you could change anything that you wanted to? And we've all got a list 7,000 feet long, right? Um, let's say it's all gone, let's start over. What are you gonna do then? Maybe you have an answer, maybe you don't. That gets you into the realm of systems thinking, holistic thinking. All right. Systems dynamic is a branch of systems thinking. It's very big at MIT and a couple of folks. Um, and it is really about the mathematical study of interactions within a system. Uh, in this case, it looks at all interactions as feedback loops, cause and effect relationships all across an organization. And what it wants to do is it wants to mathematically work backwards from events, things that happen, 
turn those into patterns. We see patterns emerge between certain interactions, and then to look at how the entire system itself behaves. Uh, Dr. Jay Forrester was the one who really kicked us off, and these are the kinds of people you can pay huge amounts of money to to come in and mathematically draw your entire organization, how everything works, and tell you why it's broken. Not really important to do all in systems dynamics, except to know it's there. If you guys have seen any of the recent work by Gene Kim and others, stuff that's going to be coming forth uh, in the uh, uh, the um, uh, DevOps cookbook, you'll notice they'll talk about the three ways. The three ways are systems thinking, systems dynamics. That's where they come from. All right, theory of constraints. Who's heard of TOC? Oh, man. Okay. Um, theory of constraints was uh, was uh, uh, a theory put forth uh, by um, uh, Dr. Goldratt, 1982 or three, uh, in a book called The Goal. And if you watch or read much about DevOps at some point, somebody will tell you, "You have to read The Goal. It changed my life." Um, the theory of constraints um, that's laid out in the book, and the, the, the book's cool because it is a novel. It walks you through and you sort of see how this thing, thing comes about. The book um, is all about a guy who's uh, in a situation where his factory's going to be shut down in like three months unless he massively turns everything around, and the guy goes crazy trying to figure out how to rebuild it, and has all these epiphanies. Um, it's a good book. It's actually a, a quick read, um, and you'll see yourself in it. You're like, yeah, I know exactly how that is. Um, but in the theory of constraints, we have kind of five focusing steps. We identify a system's constraint, okay? We decide how to exploit the system's constraint. Once we've done that, we try to subordinate everything into the above decision. Then we elevate the system's constraint. And then finally, as a result, try not to allow inertia to set it status quo. Went over everyone's head, right? Including mine. The fundamental concept of TOC in those five steps really comes down to what's known as drum buffer rope. Okay? So here we have an assembly line. Exciting, right? I knew you were like, totally, I'm going to DevOps talk. I'm going to learn about assembly lines. You are. Um, so here we have uh, three workstations. Okay. The number of units that can be produced here is five and two and eight. Okay? Where's my constraint? Two. Right there. Obvious, right? That's my constraint. Alright, what do I do about it? Right? We all have constraints in our organizations. A lot of this times this will happen in things like provisioning. If you do a lot of provisioning. Certain steps are really fast, certain steps are really slow, something requires a human being, that's your constraint. What do we do about that? You see constraints all over the place. All right, so we use drum buffer row. We use the focusing steps before. See, the first thing we need to do is identify the system's constraint. We did that. Okay, we know which ones are constraint. Now we need to decide how to exploit the system's constraint, right? Well, the important thing here is that we know that if we want to have efficient flow, what do we need to do? Just jam things into the first step as fast as possible? No, because what's going to happen? It's all going to bottle up here, right? And this guy can never possibly do all the work that he needs to do because it's constrained, right? So first thing we need to do is agree that this is our bottleneck and everything needs to move at that speed. If we only put two, 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 two in, everything's going to flow right through, just nice and right. Okay? So that becomes the drum. Okay? Boom, boom, boom. Two, 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 two. Everything dances right through the system. Okay? Now we need to subordinate everything. This means that everything else cannot process more than two units at a time. Right? Everything else has to coincide with that. And we need to see if we can elevate the system's constraint. It's a fancy way of saying, can you get another one of these machines so you can do four? Maybe you can. If you can, get another one. Now that's four. Now we can move forward a time. Get three. 
then it's not a constraint at all. Okay, maybe you can do it, maybe you can't. And if you can't, you can't let inertia set in. Because what happens, um, particularly if you have elevated this constraint and it's no longer the bottleneck, now it can process six units. Where's the bottleneck? Where's the constraint? It moved, it went somewhere else. This is one of the really important things that, that Goldratt was uh, really adamant about. A lot of times people look for the problem constraint in your organization. They work super hard to fix the, the, fix the constraint. And they fix it and they're like, hooray, we fixed the problem. There's a new problem, dude. There's a new one. It just moved now, right? Um, so in the system, drum, buffer, rope. So we set the tempo, dum, 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 two. Everything marches through. We create a pull-based system with the rope. We drag everything through the system, right? We pull. Things should only go into the system when it's going to come off the line and go somewhere, like to a customer. Otherwise, you end up producing things that never happen. So what pulls work through the system should be orders, right? No orders, don't do any work. There's no point of doing work. Otherwise, you just build inventory. Inventory is waste, right? And this idea of buffers, this is an important thing here. If we want to, we, the most important thing in this system is to ensure that this thing is always working. Always, 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 always. Because the system can only move at its speed. So this thing can never stop processing or we're screwed, right? What happens if this machine breaks down? We're screwed, everything just stops. Right? So what do we do? How do we come back there? We use buffers. We build up a cache of work ahead of this workstation, say eight units, so that even if this guy stops, this guy can continue to process. That's a buffer, okay? And so this guy does work when? When there's not enough work in the buffer, right? One of the important things that fell out of this, and this is why it shook the entire uh, uh, world of manufacturing, is this system tells us that if you've got a guy standing here, he should not be working as fast as he can. Because if he does, he's screwing the entire system. He's causing all kinds of problems. Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're saying the guy should stop working. Yes, he should stop working. Dude, he makes $14 an hour. He needs to work his ass off. No, he should only make enough parts to make sure that there's an adequate buffer for this. And then he should stop. This was a revolutionary freaking concept. It completely blew the manufacturing world apart because they couldn't understand it. Why would you pay someone to stand there and do nothing? Because they weren't employing systems thinking. All they were thinking about is each worker needs to work as hard as they can for whatever hours they have. And they were killing themselves. The US car industry did this. And this is, incidentally, why the Japanese kicked our ass. Because they figured this stuff out. Because one of our guys, Deming, who was mentioned earlier, went to Japan and taught them all the tricks. No one in America would listen to him. They changed everything, in particular Toyota, which became known as the Toyota Production System, which in 1980s, when we were suffering because the Japanese were kicking our asses, we went, how the hell is Japan doing this? They've got better quality. Whenever problems happen, they bounce back faster. How are they doing this? And they found out, oh shit, one of our guys went and taught them how to do this, and we never listened to him. And suddenly, Deming's consulting business went through the roof, okay? So lean. So in DevOps, we try to learn a lot from the past. So that's where a lot of good ideas come from. We try to draw on the principles of the Toyota production system, otherwise known as TPS. Uh, the Toyota production system was created by Ona at Toyota, but it did draw on the ideas of Deming, Drucker, Toyota, Mr. Toyota. Uh, the founder of the company. You notice that the D was changed to a T later. Uh, Shingo, Schuert, Ford, etc. If you want to learn about who all those people are, watch my horrifically boring and very popular, strangely, uh, keynote at Lisa. Um, Lean really focuses, and that is to say the Toyota production system, really focuses on el eliminating waste. Waste, otherwise in Japanese, muda. Trying to remove muda. Um, and trying to create a pull-based system. 
So the way that the Japanese really came to kick our butts in the United States, some of you probably, some of you remember this, some of you don't, um, is the oil crisis of 1973, right? Um, we produced cars in this thing called Plan Obsolescence, created by an MIT graduate, believe it or not, a GM in the 30s. Um, and so the oil crisis came, people bought fewer cars, and all these cars just spilled off assembly lines thanks to the mass production system created by Ford. Um, and all this inventory sat around, and the next year, guess what? Nobody wanted to buy the 1973 model, right? And chaos ensued. The Japanese were using a pull-based system, right? People would order cars, it would pull things through the manufacturing uh, lines in Japan. When people stopped ordering, guess what happened? Stop making cars. The next year, who do you think had a better quarter? Right? Toyota did. Right? And it, it all started to trickle out. So that's lean. Lean concepts. There are a lot of concepts in lean that are really important ones. Kaizen, continuous improvement, right? We have to be constantly improving all the time. This is what most of us refer to as the scientific method. Kanban. That's the thing you, if you guys have heard of a Kanban in, in our circles, you've heard of a perversion of Kanban. Uh, Kanban is the just in time system that enables the pull signaling. It's actually a card based system. That is, that when you're sitting on an assembly line, you have a bunch of parts to help you make a brake rotor, okay? You pull out the thing, the, 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 the box of parts, you assemble it, and you pull out the card that's in the box, and you put it in a stack, and you make it. And then you put that aside and you pick up another one and you build the next one, you put the card in the stack. What happens? Boy comes around, somebody comes around with a cart, picks up all the stacks of cards from all the people, takes those back. What are those cards? They're orders for more kits. So they go back to the storeroom, they pick up all the kits and they bring them out to the assembly line and stack them, right? Well, when they do that, all those boxes have cards in them. They take those cards, they go into a stack, then somebody goes and orders all the parts. And it goes all the way down the system. So Toyota doesn't order a damn thing until it's actually used. Everything is pulled through. And what's pulling it through? Orders. Orders are what are driving the assembly line. The assembly line is driving the entire supply chain. Right? That's what Kanban's all about. It's really important. And the interesting thing is, you know where the idea for this whole system came from? When a bunch of Japanese executives went to Chicago into a supermarket and noticed that there isn't a giant box full of bread. There's a couple loaves of bread on a rack. And what happens? You come in, you take it off. And as soon as you take it off and walk down the aisle, what happens? Somebody comes out, puts another loaf in its spot. And they went, let's do that. Inspiration comes from the strangest places. Now, other ideas, Jidoka, autonomous automation. Automation with a human touch, believe that. I won't tell you where that came from. Uh, Pokayok. Poke your eye out. Uh, mistake proofing. This is the idea of building things that can only be done the right way. This is a way of ensuring quality. So you just design something such that only two parts can ever be put together in a certain way. If you don't, it doesn't fit. It doesn't work. Um, that's the way you create something called zero defects. Um, just don't make things that can be screwed up. Um, this is also things like in milling platforms and stuff, they would have a little tray. You'd machine the part and you'd slide it over to the side and it would, if it fit, it was done. If it didn't fit, it didn't work. Um, this is used in manufacturing today. They'll have all these blocks you'll see all around and you take the part and you mill it down and you slide it through and if it's, it has two different gauges, too big, too small. Um, 5S, sorting, simplifying, sweeping, standardizing, sustaining. Right, a way of doing, uh, of, of kind of maintaining things. 5Y, science close to me and D-Trace's heart. Uh, root cause analysis. Anyone ever heard of 5Y? Yeah, it's really simple, right? Uh, the idea is to get to root cause analysis, you ask 5Y times. Uh, 5Y five times. Um, so you say like, uh, uh, you know, we're out of bread. Why? Because I didn't feel like getting it. Why? Because I was really busy at work. Why? Because I got this project that's coming in. Why? Because people are stupid. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the point is to not go two layers deep, right? You try and go as far down. This is definitely a fast, hard rule, and it should be applied with rigor, but it is it is a good idea. With D-Trace, this is a, a, a good idea, right? Is, is D-Trace is a tool that allows us, when we do systems analysis, to dig why. Why does that happen? 
okay, well, why does that happen? Well, why does that happen? We just dig deeper, deeper, deeper down layers until we find something that's useful. Uh, without stopping just because we're like, oh, we will solve reason number three. No, keep going. Um, this idea, we, we mentioned this before, mood of waste. Removing all non-value add action. This includes, there's all types of different uh, uh, muda. Uh, one of them is uh, transportation, moving. You should never have people walking with things in a factory, right? Put the machine right there. Slide. No walking. Um, all kinds of muda. Um, if you think about it, in our organizations, there's all kinds of muda. The, the most common type of, of, of muda uh, is, is waiting waiting for something, right? Somebody produces something, the next person needs to take it, so this might be your development team releases a piece of software, now your operations team needs to move it out to the customers on the website, and it just sits there. It's going nowhere. During that time, the clock is ticking and no value is being added to it, right? Um, in, the, in the TPS model, every time anyone, it, it should be constantly be given uh, value added to it, right? Because in a classical sense, uh, Something goes into a raw material goes into one side of the assembly line, value added material comes up to that the whole time between your adding value. So that was boring. Okay. It's a lot of stuff, right? You didn't expect that, right? So. So, creation and exploitations of tools. Uh, this is the one everyone loves. So, prepare to be excited. Is there any more Guinness out there? <laughs> oh. You can thank our range, she got it for you. Yeah, but there's no. There's, you ever drink it out of the. Like a shot of paper. Okay. These are the common DevOps tools, right? <coughs> did I miss anything? No. Yeah. What did I miss? Circonus is a new one. I, I, I use Circonus for a time. Right? These are the DevOps tools, man. We use Chef Puppet or CF Engine. We use Dagios, Ganglia. We're using Graphite with Stats D. Some Moonin. Splunking it. Or I'm super cool and I'm log stashing into Greylog 2. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right? DevOps tools, right? Has everyone heard my, my not guess rant? Have they ever heard of the monitoring sucks <laughs> movement? Yeah. Hashtag monitoring sucks. You guys heard of that one? Did anybody agree with it? Monitoring sucks? Sometimes. Yeah. Not just sucks. Monitoring sucks. Ask, sucks. <laughs> ask people when they think monitoring sucks what monitoring tool they use. Nine times out of nine. Ten times out of ten. <laughs> use the Nagios! Figure it out. Naga sucks. <laughs> I use Zabbix. So I'm not a shill for Zabbix, but love yourself. Use Zabbix. Um, there are lots of good monitoring tools. I'm not trying to say that Nagios sucks and you should use one other thing. Just Nagios just sucks. Uh, <laughs> these are all great tools, right? They're all great tools. But are they DevOps tools? They're definitely hip. They're tools. Okay. Are these DevOps tools? Yes. You're missing SSH. SSH is not a tool in the same way that air is not a resource. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like air is only like is really important to you when you don't have it. In the same way that like if you go to a university and everything's like Telnet Kerberos, you're like, dear lord, just give me SSH. <laughs> Otherwise you don't think about it, it's ubiquitous. <laughs> Are these DevOps tools? Sure. Now what's the difference? <coughs> They're not as cool. Some are 40 years old. I, if you don't think <laughs> Awk is cooler than Nagios, I will arm wrestle you to the yeah. <laughs> The difference, what makes something a DevOps tool is not who made it or how cool it is or how many times it's mentioned in Velocity, it is how you use it. Notice that Post-it Notes is on there. One of the most DevOps friendly tools there is. Go to a friendly Post-it Note, right? Where's the Git repository? Here's the post What password to use? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody want to hit them? 
person. <laughs> yeah, you know people do. No, 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 I'm under the keyboard. The important thing is, is not what tool you use, it's how you use it. It's how you use it, right? Um, this is, of course, the best DevOps tool ever, <laughs> right? Your tool should be bringing people together, enabling flow. Remember talking about flow, 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 okay? Beer tends to let people flow. All right, so what is a DevOps tool? Any tool that brings, remember the three layers? Aids in the convergence of process and aids in the collaboration of people. It must support flow. It must support flow. Okay. So, beer. Does beer aid in the convergence of process? Does it aid in the collaboration of people? Now, I put question marks here, not yes, yes. Because in some of your companies, having everyone go out for a beer might not actually aid in process or collaboration of people. It may not, right? It may just cause a giant bitch fest. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Everyone's like, I know, I'm gonna smooth it over with that guy. We've never seen eye to eye. I gotta take him out to dinner and we'll bond and you know, we'll finally get over it. And then you're like, nah, he's just an asshole. <laughs> right? It doesn't always work, right? Maybe it does, <coughs> right? Um, maybe just going, you know, if you're having, if you're not working well with the dev team and the operations team or the QA team aren't working well together, a lot of times this also happens where like dev people tend to have a lower opinion of ops people uh, uh, ops people tend to have a lower opinion of QA people, and, you know what I mean? There's all these things where people feel under other people. Just going to their damn meeting and just listening, don't talk, just listen in their meetings, might be like, what? I didn't think you even cared what we do. I do. Um, that might be enough. Now, metrics, right? I don't do memes, so I don't have the measure all the things uh, slide. But metrics, um, do graphs like this aid in the convergence of process or the collaboration of people? Probably the most important thing is, do you show it to anybody? If I create the world's greatest graph of like all of like user latency to our to our front end website, right? This is this is the customer experience. If you don't show that. To everyone else in the organization, is it really all that helpful? No, it's really fascinating for you, but everyone else is screwed. You gotta unlock all those metrics. So just graphing all the things may or may not be a DevOp tool. If you give that graph to everyone, you put it in a dashboard so it's easy to consume pull, you put some labels on it so it's clear what people know, and all of a sudden the lady sitting at the front desk, at the reception desk, knows how the business is doing, and your CEO knows how the business is doing, and your devs know, that's a tool that's bringing people together. That's you taking your skills and doing some amazing things and using a tool to do it. But if it's just sitting there on some back-end dashboard or just in, sitting in ganglia doing nothing, it's not helping anybody, okay? And you can apply that same model to any of those tools, you know? Um, you know, even with Nagios or something, or, or whatever, right? If you give your developers access to that and they know when the site's down, that's a DevOps tool. If it's just you getting pages, not a DevOps tool. So, remember, it's about customers. It's about flow. And an important thing, it is about pride of workmanship. All of us have pretty much devoted our lives to this, right? Not a lot of flakes in this business, right? You don't get in this because the money's good, right? There's too much frustration for that. The barrier's too high. You should actually enjoy what you do. Most of us would do this if we weren't getting paid for it. In fact, most of us didn't get paid for it at one point. We're doing it, and we eventually found out that somebody would pay us money for the damn thing. Um, you should enjoy what you're doing, and you should have pride in your work. And you shouldn't have to struggle to do that, most importantly. It, there's, the environment should allow you to have pride in your work. And if you're not having fun, you are doing it wrong. Thank you. Questions? So you mentioned Nagios, and I think you're right, we all sort of hate Nagios, but like there's not a lot that's better. 
Yeah. But you mentioned something yeah, that you like better. What do you like? What? Why? What is it? I, you said it. I didn't catch the name of it. But why is it better? Because it's not why? Like it? Yeah. Does anybody else care about this? I can tell you why. Um, are you still videotaping? Yes, do you want me not to? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I won't demonstrate. Um, there's a couple of things. Um, so, Nagios's big problem is configuration, right? Configuration on this. And it's fine when it's small, right? Even when it's small, you're like, oh, yeah, there's a lot of configuration. But it's manageable. Um, over time, it just balloons completely out of control. A lot of people are doing configuration management to manage their freaking Nagios configuration. It's just out of control to the point that if you ever lost the damn thing and had to rebuild it, you're like, oh no, right? You have to definitely build a framework to rebuild the configuration based on all of your nodes, you're screwed. Um, it's crazy. Um, I chose to use Zabbix. I chose Zabbix for a couple of reasons. One, uh, it's a distributed system that uses proxies. So I have data centers all across the world. Um, and at one point, I had a separate monitoring system in each one of those data centers. And where's where's stuff having problems? The one that you're not looking at, right? You'd have to go and look at literally, you know, all these different uh, dashboards. So that was one problem. I needed a tool that brought all that together into one. I need to see the entire state of my business on one screen. Um, another one is adding nodes in, in Nagios is, is impossible. It is real. Right at scale, at scale, okay, uh, it can be a real pain. Uh, there's, a, a, it can become a very fragile process. Um, Zabbix has auto registration, so a node fires up, so the agent starts, and it contacts the server. It's actually going to contact a proxy, and the proxies get sent to the server. The server says, "I've never seen you before," and so it registers it automatically, and it's now added to the system, and it says it, there are rules you can assign to it, actions you can assign to it. Um, and it, it says, oh, but well, you came off this proxy. Okay, that means you're in that data center. I want you to associate these templates, right? And now all the checks that I want assigned to it are assigned to it, and it's now collecting all the data, and it's, it's all good. Uh, another cool thing about Zabbix is that every metric that you, that you pull is inherently graphed. This is one of those things where you're not gonna build a dashboard based on these things, right? This is not a replacement for, for, for graphite. Uh, or RD tool or whatever you're using. Um, but what's handy about it is there are certain metrics that you don't care about the graph until you really wish you had it. Uh, a good example would be temperatures. Temperatures on your on your planer, right? You don't normally care about seeing the up and down of that until there is a massive spike across 50 different machines, which happened in our data center once. And all of a sudden you're like, when did the temperature start rising, right? Having that graph and being like, ah, six hours ago, it started up. Really handy to have when you need it. Um, there are a couple other things like it is Zabbix I like because it is agent based. Um, uh, the server never pulls the pulls the server or the the Zabbix server never actually pulls the the agent running on the machine. Um, rather, it's 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 the other way around. So the agent when it checks in is told here's what you're expected to do. It gathers all that stuff and sends it at regular intervals upstream, which means I can scale significantly without overwhelming a given master because it's got too many machines to pull or something. Um, the rules are easier to write. Extension is really simple. It has this idea of user parameters where you could just give it like a, a key, a key and a value, and the, the value is just you know a one line shell script, uh, sh shell line to go and pull some metric. So I can add things super trivially. And then I manage the whole thing through Chef. So a new node comes up, I Chef it. Um, it fires up Chef, installs the agent, it checks in, and everything's done. Um, and it's just super, super easy. Um, like I said, Zamix is not the only system. There are lots of other ones. Um, even a lot of the, the, the you know, was it Insignia? Mm -hmm. and, a, and, a, and a couple others that have tried to make it for the deficits of Nagios, I think, are questionably doing better jobs. Um, just adding graphing to, like, some of them have done is not enough in and of itself, but there are options, is the thing. I, I think a lot of people feel like they're stuck, that Nagios is the only way, right? Which is funny, because Nagios came around to unseat people who thought the HP OpenView was the only way, right? Like, no, you can use Nagios, or NetSaint before that. Remember NetSaint? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My, I don't have the gray beard, but I should. 
So who monitors your zappings? <laughs> I do. Um, so um, I actually use okay, tiered, tiered monitoring. So that's a valid question. So I use Pingdom. So Zavix monitors my entire production environment, and then I use uh, a Pingdom to actually back channel a lot of these other things and give me redundant checks. But that's one of the other things I like doing in, in, in Zavix is I actually monitor just about everything, and Elijah's been a huge help with this. We, we monitor just about everything like two or three different ways so that we have kind of dead man checks and all these sorts of things so that we can catch weird scenarios. The, of course, one of the important things in a system like that where the agents are doing all the work and shoving it up is if something stops working, how do you know that it stopped working, right? You never asked it how it was doing in the first place. Um, so we do that through, we have certain checks that like if a node has not reported data in 10 minutes, we throw an alarm, <coughs> which tends to be really, really helpful in odd situations where systems hang. Uh, where it's up, it's pinging, you may even be able to log into the damn thing, but processes stops spawning or something like that. You have some kind of odd condition, all of a sudden, agent's not working, it's not sending data up, and guess what, we just caught it. Yeah, the load average is 10,000 or something. Yeah. Well, those are the situations, like if the load average was 10,000, I would've caught it. The, the ones where everything just stops, yeah. those are really hard to catch. Um, and those are ones that we can catch very easily just by the nature of our system, so. Um, now, I will say, to, to be fair, because I'm a sysadmin, I hit everything too. Um, <laughs> the, the one downside to Zabbix, if you are going to implement it, is, is that one of the ways it does all these beautiful, wonderful things is by storing everything in a database. At some point, that's a yeah. big database, right? And obviously, you have database scaling issues. So that's something you need to deal with. Um, great way to deal with that, Percona. Percona makes everything better. Um, we Before we were running Percona, uh, life was terrible. Uh, the other thing is is that um, lots of tools, Nagios and others, have uh, the ability to do escalations and things like that. Don't believe in that. Um, use pager duty. So none of our tools do escalation anymore. Everything just goes to pager duty and it handles those escalation. So Pingdom, Zabbix, and pager duty is what we use. I really like your example with the library's house comparing Well, I mean, this is the trick. Um, this is this is a, a lot of people have done a lot of great work on, on why companies change, right? Why why company starts out and everyone's very passionate about. Over time, it ceases to be like that. A lot of times, that's because the founder becomes further and further away. So why did why did I mean Apple? Apple was a company that, that was founded, had wild success, and then tremendous failure, and then tremendous success. And where is it going right now? <laughs> right? I think we'd all agree, right? Everyone saw, you know, Cook comes out there and says, I'm sorry that our navigation app isn't so great. Right? You're like, whoa! Hello there, dog. Right? Because it actually wasn't that bad. It was, I mean, it was awful. But, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, anyway, it's an interesting example of the whole thing. Um, this is, this is what happens when the vision gets too far away. And that's what happened to Apple, uh, to, to, to Dell. And a lot of other companies, right? They had these tremendous ideas. They had very passionate founders who were all about what they were trying to do, and why they were trying to do it, why it was passionately important to them. And what happens is either that person leaves, in the case of Apple, right? Steve leaves. Somebody comes in who doesn't care about the why, he just cares about the what and the how. He keeps making products. Some pretty good products, I love Newton. It was a fantastic product, but right? The passion wasn't there to sustain it because they lost their fundamental core reason for existing, their why. And the company slid until jobs came back. And what was important is, is the jobs was always out there. So we were, as consumers, we were connecting direct with Steve, right? There were a couple other people in the band around him, right? But ultimately it was about Steve. And we trusted Steve, right? He believed what we believed. We bought into that vision. We bought into that why. Right? And the real challenge for Apple now in the future is going to be, can we still connect with Apple, with the brand, without him being there? So I think a lot of us were connecting more with Steve Jobs than we were with Apple. And that's going to play out in the next couple of years. 
Um, Dell is a great example. Michael Dell's a fantastic guy, but he got pushed back, 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 back. Right? All of a sudden, he wasn't so much the forward-facing person of that company. Now, mind you, this is where where you get layers of customers, right? Um, there are certain people who care very much about Dell, and they focus very. They know where to look, right? They're they're focusing on Michael Dell. Screw all the peons around him. Focusing on Michael Dell, right? And those people are going to have a different opinion of Dell than people like perhaps myself, who are just not that. We don't believe so much. We're not that engaged, and we just sort of passively take whatever we get. And his message is lost, right? Um, this is what happens when companies get really big. Um, and that's why it's really important to, to keep out there and to keep that vision with your customers. A couple questions on the stream. Uh, let's see. I didn't realize I was streamed. Yes, I thought are. you were recording for YouTube or something. Come on, I'm here with a camera. What do you think is happening? <laughs> Never question Deirdre. Ever. Somebody says, or Nahum says, if I haven't read any of the books he mentions, which would he recommend first? Um, if you were to buy only one book, I would recommend recommend buying an operations management textbook. Just have it, skim through it, uh, be impressed, put it on your shelf, forget about it. Um, and then when you need it, go back to into refer to it. Um, and if you want to get into all the other things, get into all the other things. Um, there are lots of books to read. Um, I bought them all and read them all. And I'm crazy. Um, but yeah, if you're going to buy only one, buy a textbook. There's also a hope that you will make the slides available so people can go back. Slides are already available. I actually gave this. I actually wrote this talk for LA DevOps that I presented like three months ago. So the slides are already. Available. I will repost them. Any any other on the stream? Uh, no. Someone just says uh, thanks, Ben. You're awesome. Yeah. Shout out to the stream people because I'm normally okay. in my garage smoking and watching the stream because I can smoke at home when I watch on the stream rather than being in person. Yes, this is all so. just part of the campaign to stop you smoking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Go ahead, sir. Thanks for the talk. Really great. Thanks. I was curious if you've heard of the DevOps Borat. <laughs> DevOps yes. Borat. Yes, I have. Sometimes he's <laughs> funny. Other times I want to shoot him. Like That was my impression of what DevOps was, so it's great that I got the talk. It is, it is, I mean, he, yeah, 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 he is a parody. <laughs> he is a parody. Um, it, it, is, it is satire, so... Yeah. <laughs> I can do all things because I measure all the things. Uh, you, you first and then you. Yeah. So you talked about a lot of uh, monitoring tools. Right? But what is what do you use for converting this monitoring into like actionable you know, instructions for somebody to you know, resolve that whatever you're about doing monitoring? Yeah. Mm. Uh, I only partially got here to my monitoring just monitor. <laughs> <laughs> So what do you use to convert you know, the information that you got by monitoring into actionable instructions to go and fix the problem? Uh, a combination of two things. Um, one is um, honing, Zabbix calls them triggers, it, and allows you a lot of flexibility in crafting that, right? Because yeah, one of the things that's really important um, in, in, in any response that you send a human being, it needs to evoke an emotional response, right? You know, a stack trace in your email just irritates you, right? Like your your emotional reaction is go away, right? Um, you want something that 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 like makes you feel like it's broken and evokes this sort of like I must fix it, I must I must go and make it right, right? Um, that's a difficult thing to do. So so working on on the alerts that your system sends and making sure that um, both that they're actionable and that they're also very direct um, and. and you know, something is down, you know, it's not, you know, um, some odd metric. Um, the other is to get very good at how you categorize them. Like a lot of, like, in, in my alerts are, are, are categorized. I have disasters. Those are what go to pager duty. Then I've got other ones like hi, and, you know, all these things that are interesting to know, I need to know about, but I don't need to be woken up in the middle of the night. Um, but, but I still want on my radar. Um, the thing that needs to go along with that is SOPs. Right, so whoever's in your operations team or responding to pages needs to have access to a repository of procedures, and those procedures need to be very, very clear. Right, um, they need to be step. I and I drive yeah, Elijah yeah. crazy. It's got to be step one, step two, step three, step four. It's got to have prerequisites, right? Because um, a procedure 
that was written for somebody who's done the procedure 12 times before is completely unuseful. Because then the person who's never done it before, which may be me mm -hmm. in many cases, um, you know, it's like log into the web server. Shit. Where is it? Where's the web server? <laughs> What's the IP address of the web server? Uh, I don't know. Crap, right? It's like the procedure is now useless because you don't even know how to perform step. So just being very concise, and I wrote a blog post about this while about right, writing better SOPs, um, but writing very, very clear procedures is very important. Making sure that everyone in the company, especially anybody on, on response, knows where they are and can find them. But it, it, it does take a lot of diligence to write them all. Do you, do you see them being automated? Uh, procedures being automated? Yeah. Ooh. You're taking me into a place where I can go for a long time. <coughs> I was talking to Mark Burgess, actually, of CF Engine fame last night over dinner. Um, one, of the, one of the subjects that is extremely near and dear to my heart is knowledge management um, and how we store knowledge, right? All of us spend all, of, all day long, we're knowledge workers. Okay? That's what we're called, we're knowledge workers uh, in what's called the third wave that we talk about. Um, and what do we do all day long? We learn stuff for a living. That's what we get paid to do, right? Uh, as employers, we pay our employees to learn and to do stuff, right? Um, where does all that knowledge go? Into the bit bucket, into your head, right? It just generally sees. What if you could take all that knowledge that you're producing and store it so that the entire company could benefit? That would be amazing. How do you do that? No freaking idea, right? The, the, the best innovation that we came up with 10 years ago was the wiki. And the only innovation to the wiki since the invention of the wiki was the hashtag. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm dead serious. In knowledge management academic circles, that is the greatest innovation, is the freaking tag, right? Um, it's, it's concerning. So do you automate it? Mark Burgess has very certain ideas about CF Engine, if you've ever looked at CF Engine, it's very complicated, it's all this, but it's all about embedding knowledge within your configuration and inextric inextricably linking them together so that you form a semantic knowledge web at the same time you configure all of your machines and devices to do what they need to do. And it's it's combined and it's beautiful. And most people don't get it. <laughs> um, including myself, including myself. I'm still coming around. Um, so. If you're really interested in that sort of thinking, just very seriously look at CF Engine, um, uh, CF Engine 3, cfengine.org. Uh, they have a, a free trial and, and you'll be blown away by the sorts of things you can do with it. But, but it, it doesn't require a very in-depth. Uh, if you're just the kind of person like most of us who are just like, damn it, just create 15 users on every single one of my boxes, it's not gonna help. I think uh, your battery died. Hmm? My battery died. Um. Going back to your like, how do you store knowledge stuff? There's a lot of stuff about library sciences. I have a friend who's a library scientist, and she talks about how do we store knowledge and stuff a lot. Um, on our Twitter feed. But my question is, um, going back to knowledge. So like, inevitably, like within your company, you're going to have like these knowledge silos <coughs> where like, all of the DB admins like hang out together, and they go out to lunch together, and they talk about stuff at lunch together, and they're coming up with these ideas. And the ops people, they all sit in the basement. You know, and they're doing their opsy stuff, <laughs> and the devs, you know, are doing their dev stuff, you know, and so, like, but across the board, like, you need everybody to have this operational mindset, and because you're delivering a product, and so you've got, you've got opinions, like, from Theo Schlossnagel, who said, like, everybody needs to have an operational mindset, mm -hmm. and then you've got other opinions where it's like, well, why don't we just, like, take, you know, these ops guys and embed them in dev groups, so you have, like, this embedded ops person, but it's still, like, He's the specialist, and he does all the ops stuff in this dev team. Both are right, okay. but it all depends on that, on, on Cynic. Yeah. Are we doing the what or doing the why? Because if you're just saying like, hey man, we should all get together, kumbaya, I'm gonna embed myself in your team. <laughs> why? Because it'll improve our efficiency and we'll get along better, right? Not gonna work. You're like, who the hell are you? Get the hell out of here. Yeah, yeah. Part of that's cultural, right? It's like we talked about before, people believe what you believe, right? Ops people believe very different things than deaf people do. We have different fundamental belief structures, which I can get into if you want to, but that's a little arcade. Um, value propositions and things. Um, so this is why I said it's really important to focus on that customer, that woman. 
if we're all thinking about her, our end customer, then all the idea of why do you want to be in my dev team? Because of her. Because I want to make her experience better. I want to make sure that when she hits the site, it's fast, it's responsive. I don't ever want to lose a transaction because she's sitting there, has got better things to do, and when she goes to click to order whatever, right, whether it's a bank site or a whatever, we want her experience to be the best that it can be so she can get done what she wants to do and move on, Yeah. right? If that's your focus, then all of it makes sense. Yeah, come and be part of our group. How can we improve our latencies? How can we make sure that if we do have an error in our code, and it shows up on the website, how can we do that in a graceful way that redirects the customer so that they can get to where they need to go, right? Um, all of us have examples of websites that we care a lot about, right? And if something breaks, we're gonna be very interested. Like GitHub might be a good example, right? If it throws an error, we're gonna be like, holy crap, GitHub threw an error, right? If we go to something like Eventbrite or Ticketmaster to order a ticket and it doesn't work, holy shit, piece of crap, Just, I need my ticket, I wanna go see a concert, I, it's gonna sell out, give me the ticket, right? There are sites we care about using and care sites we, we have an emotional connection with. And we need to think about that person who does not give a crap about our well-being as a company. They just need a service and they wanna do it and they wanna do it efficiently. And we wanna enable that. And so if you have that mindset, everything else will follow through. What happens is we get distance away from that and the user is just a line in a log, you know? And what gets us screwed because we don't have enough quarterly revenue at the end of the year and we're all not getting Christmas bonuses or something like that. When it gets abstracted away, everything goes downhill and you don't care so much, right? We all like to be heroes, right? When we're working and striving and we're doing the best that we can because, because of that end customer, we feel a lot better. You go home at the end of the day, you made somebody happy, right? Or in the case of Pinterest, you ruin people's marriages. <laughs> I actually saw them at Velocity and went out and I'm like, screw you, I want my wife back, you bastard. And they're like, we have the same problem with our wives. <laughs> Except that they, they call us when it's slow. Damn it, speed up the website, I can't, I can't pin it. Other questions? So how hard do you find it uh, in convincing people that DevOps is really not just about the tools? Not extremely hard. Extremely hard. But the tools are the easiest part to do, right? Um, and honestly, it's it's part of the way sysadmins think. Developers do this too, but sysadmins do it more, right? Um, this goes back to the fundamental value proposition: how devs and ops think differently, sysadmins think differently, right? We love to figure it out. Fundamentally at our core, that's what we do, is we figure shit out. We're the guys who don't read the instructions and get it right the first time anyway, right? That's where we get our, our value from. That's what we really makes us feel good. Um, our greatest joy is doing something with a piece of software or whatever that the creator never envisioned, right? We're like, dude, it can do that. And like, I didn't know it could do that. And we're like, hell yeah, I'm a sysadmin, man. I made it do that. And like. <laughs> It's a printer, I didn't know it could make jello. It can! <laughs> Buffoon, I am a sysadmin. Um, that's what we do. So what happens when we go and see presentations at DevOps, right? We're scanning, scanning, and say blah, 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 tool. Ah, I'll use your tool, and then I'm gonna freaking figure it out myself. <coughs> I'll implement it. And I'll have the coolest shot. And what was the most important thing? The most important message was culture. Not the tool you use, how you use the tool. But that just, right? And it's an important thing for all of us is, you know, right? You ever read a book and skip to the example, right? You read a blog post and you see a shell, you know, example, you know, code block in the middle and you're just like, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, there we go, <laughs> right? Uh, Brendan Gregg spends lots of time writing amazing books for system administrators and everyone skips to the examples and he wants to kill all of us. <laughs> I used to be a sysadmin too. I, 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 I you still are, sir. <laughs> <laughs> it never leaves you. <laughs> I, I want a parallel universe of man pages and example pages. Exactly. Where you type example such and such, and you just cut through the man page. Just give me the example. This is one of the great. Yeah, this is one of the things I, I when I I because I, I start I'm I'm old, so I started on Solaris, and then I like I like Linux came along, and I'd like open a man page and go straight to the bottom and be like, what? No examples. How does anyone know how to do anything? They probably read these things or something. <laughs> <laughs> or O'Reilly sells a lot of books. That's not a purpose. Mm. 
Oh. Yeah, it, so, it, in kind of getting into that, right? But as sysadmins, we have very certain odd needs. Devs love to build things. Yeah. They like to take a bunch of code, like, look, there was nothing. There was these scraps of code, and I assembled a cathedral. Behold my glory. I have built it. Right? It's generally at odds with the guy who's like, you built it, but I'm going to make it make jello. <laughs> right? And it's like, damn it, it was perfect. You're like, yeah, yeah. Right? I'm not going to use it the way you intended. I'm going to do whatever I want to do with it. Right? It's like, hmm, why are we at odds with each other? I have no idea. Then you got the QA guy in the middle is just like, I can break stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm serious. If you've ever met a really good QA person, like, you know, the dev comes along and it's like, it's perfect, it's bulletproof. Go ahead and try it, right? And then you have the QA guy, he's like, oh, I can smash it. <laughs> Look, stupid programmer. <laughs> stupid programmer, right? Of course, the ops guy's like, yeah, beat him up before it comes to me. <laughs> don't forget marketing. Oh, man. Marketing's, I don't even understand marketing. <laughs> No, but this is, this is an important thing, particularly as, as we move towards DevOps and, and we're working closer together, what makes us different, right? You don't see many people who are, who are sysadmins become programmers and programmers become sysadmins. It happens, but generally it happens very early in your career, right? Why does that, why does that transition not happen, right? Also, I mean, think CS, pro, uh, CS uh, programs, right? If you want to go work with computers and you go to university, where are you going to go? You're going to go one of two ways, EE, which means you're going to hardware, or you're going to go to CS. What's CS produce? Programmers. Generally really bad ones. Okay. Depends on, it depends on the university, right? Um, but, but generally it produces very bad programmers. Where do all the sysadmins come from CS education? The people who are like, blah, 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 Unix machine. <laughs> right? Right. Most of mo the best gray beards of all time were physics guys. They're like, that's an interesting problem in physics, except the supercomputer we built to solve the problem was way more fun than the, the problem itself. That's where our best Unix guys came from. So it's all about that core motivation. And that's an important thing for all of us as, as things change over the next 10, 20 years, when things become more, more ambiguous between all these different groups is what, what's really important to you? What do you enjoy doing? What, where does your core value come from? Is it from building something great, like a sysadmin, putting it all together, building a, something wonderful? Or you know, building software and, and, and doing things that nobody has ever seen? You know, these things are important and subtle, but, but drastic. Anybody else? Did you make the end of the one minute explanation of your role with Joanne? Oh, man. <laughs> oh, you talking about work? <laughs> mm. So I'm, uh, so I prefer the title uh, Director of Systems Engineering because as you've seen in the talk, I believe seriously in, in systems thinking and, and I engineer systems. Uh, uh, but I run the cloud, <coughs> I, I run the cloud operations. Um, so uh, Elijah is my colleague um, and we handle uh, the day-to-day -day operations of the joint cloud. So adding nodes, when your machine crashes, not that that happens, it doesn't ever happen, but uh, if that would happen, we would deal with that. We deal with support escalations. We build all the backend infrastructure systems that monitor and automate the, the joint cloud and, and all those sorts of things. And there's actually a video up right now of Ben talking at great length and in great detail about exactly what he does at Joint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you want to see sort of a, a, a taste of, of how we do things in Joint Operations, Show. So the Lumos days on, on, yeah, on YouTube. Right now it's the top item on the SmartOS blog. And, and it's also on the ZFS.com site. And you can see, in there I go into things like why we use Zabbix and how we do things and what we do with Chef. And I go into things like, you know, why LDAP is awesome and anyone who creates users through Chef should be shot. Um, <laughs> and, you know, RBAC and BSM and all those sorts of geeky sorts of things. That was a great talk. I think. In, in, in general, I'm, I'm trying to be like our Lord, omnipresent, omnipotent, <laughs> uh, right? I mean, it's just it's the real trick, right? I, I'm, I'm a human being. And this is the thing you get to do with like Toffler certified and stuff, but I'm a human being. I'm not a machine. Um, I want machines to do work.
come to me and say, we need a human to come over here and help us. And so I spend a lot of time trying to build systems that can do that. So I can be where I'm needed as a human being and the machines can do the rest of the work. And it's a harder thing than it seems, right? The Lord's got angels and I've got just a lot of agents. <laughs> so, so one of the themes that came out when people were asking questions were things like how do you decide when you should involve a human being, how do you determine you know, what level of detail for the process that needs to be implemented by somebody, what the SOP should look like. And it comes down to, um, remember the slide with the five whys on it? So if I write a process that Ben's gonna follow, it's five whys all the way down. Because otherwise, there's gonna be something in there he doesn't know. Because I'm an we idiot. Too, we have too many moving I'm parts. Dumb. Everybody has too many moving parts. It's not just it's not just me or Ben or one of you guys. Um, everywhere. Yeah. Am ambiguity is really hard. Ambiguity is the enemy of information, right? It, it is, and this is the the, the, the funny thing. It's just like a theory, right? You know, you can do a thousand experiments to prove it, but it only takes one failure to disprove it. It's completely thrown out. And it's like any procedure, anything that we do, right? Um, the thing that I'm most afraid of is the thing I don't know I need to know about. That's the one thing that scares me, right? And like I said, in a lot of our cases, the pragmatic example is somebody says, go do something. You're like, I don't even know where to go. I don't know where that thing is. That's a problem. Um, so, yeah. Get rid of ambiguity. But that also means that you gotta remove some of your pride, right? All of us like to hide things in order to you know, make ourselves sort of indispensable. I mean, I, I know none of you do that. I mean, <laughs> other people somewhere. We also don't want to be bothered about those things. Exactly. Very busy. Exactly. Well, we think you're indispensable, Ben. So thank you very much for the talk. Thank you. Hope you guys all liked it. Uh, so we're all here to chat, and we're on Twitter. And Take for you. I'm always trying to take stack of our stickers and like stick them in tabs in the bathroom stall at the airport and then we can all these places that they really should. Oh, that might give people the wrong impression. <laughs>